Hey, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Bottom Line. I'm your host, Lauren Khalil. If you like listening to us chat about CrossFit news and everything that's going on in the sport, make sure to like and subscribe to our channel. On today's show, we have CrossFit analysts Brian Friend and Tyler Watkins, who recently wrote an article looking at baseball stats and showing some correlations of how we can reference them to track CrossFit athlete performance, something you two have been doing far before we had any uh, tables. You both have created your own, but Tyler... I want to start with you on what really inspired this article comparing baseball stats like a player's batting average to CrossFit. And is this something that you've been looking at for a while? Yeah. um, So I'll start with if I've been looking at it for a while. So it all started when I was at CrossFit Maximus um, about five years ago. They had a team there and it was really competitive. And I was I wanted to be on that team very badly. And so I started wanting to measure performance and how how good do I have to be? And then you quickly fall into the wormhole of like, that's a really hard thing to figure out. Um, and so I just never stuck into it. Um, as far as the baseball thing goes, I saw how difficult I, I started having conversations with Brian about what his process he went through and, you know, compared it to the process I went through. And it's like, there was no standard way. Same thing with Chad Schroeder. He, he has his own way of doing it. And so I was like, it's really unapproachable for like a common fan or a lay person to approach the sport in like, who's best? How do you measure that? And so I wanted to create like a standardized statistic we could all use. That's not, you can't really fudge it all that much. How long have you been working on uh, this Excel sheet that we'll get to in just a bit? (laughs) Just, you know, just a little while, (laughs) a few years. I feel like both of you, have you guys ever compared and shared your Excel sheets with all of the different stats you both have? We've definitely, we've definitely shared some stuff. Um, You know, it's, it's one of those things like, like Tyler said, you know, there's not a a defined way to evaluate performance outside of, you know, well, these were their finishes at these events. And then if you want to get more specific than that, you can say, well, this is how they did in specific workouts. The problem in CrossFit is that, you know, you don't go up to the plate and take a swing and it's either a this, 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 or this, and there's only like five options. Instead, there's an infinite number of possibilities and combinations and time domains and placements within the course of the weekend that these things can show up. And so there's so many variables that there's almost like a limitless right now, at least like a limitless amount of different ways you can approach trying to quantify that when assessing one athlete's chances against another. So we have shared some stuff, but, uh, you know, and his stuff is different than mine. And certainly there's uh, others out there that have different things. And there's probably things that we still even haven't uh, necessarily considered. But when he came to me with this idea for establishing a couple metrics that could be like a baseline way to compare athletes in a more quantifiable way or consistent way, I thought that that was really good. And I actually, as I mentioned to him, you know, that uh, there's even like baseball has been around for almost 200 years now, and there's still new statistics coming out in baseball. You know, in the past 10 years or so, there's a stat that I think is called uh, wins against replacement. They just call it war. This stat didn't exist 50 years ago, maybe even 20, 30 years ago. And now it's almost like the premier metric that's used to evaluate a player's value. So, but, but the only way that you can get to a statistic like that is to have a foundation or a baseline. And I think that's what Tyler's trying to do. And Tyler, I want to bring up um, that Excel sheet that kind of goes over some of the different uh, data points that you have compiled. And maybe you can kind of walk us through some of the key notable points here. You looked at leader average, performance rate, and podium rate. How did you come up with um, those three components and how you would come to the, uh, the, the data and the numbers at the end? Okay, so I'll just go across and start with leader average. Um, this one is straight off batting average. So, and Brian and I had some, like, we, we talked about what was best. And it, this one is actually different from the one I um, wrote in the article. So the leader average that I calculated before was if you place in the top 10, it counted. And you count the number of times you place in the top 10 and you divide it by the number of events you competed in. Um, Brian thought 10 was a little bit too much. And I, I started to agree with him the longer I looked at the statistics. And so I made it to where um, this one's based off five. So it's, if you scored within the top five or placed within the top five on any event, it counts and you divide it by the total number of events you had. Basically it says 
for Tia Toomey, you see there it says 80%. That means 80% of the time in this season, she has been in the top five. And it obviously shows how much uh, further ahead percentage wise she is than the rest of the field. Right. <clears throat> right. And so like looking ahead, um, if you, if you extrapolated this out, you could take that to say like, there's an 80% chance on any given event that Tia will be in the top five. So then when you tab over to the men's side, you're obviously using the same three metrics straight across, um, this, this field is not so extreme when you look at the men's side. Right. So, and right. So Justin Medeiros is a 60% leader average, which means he'll be in the top five, um, 60% of the time or has been, and you could guess that he probably will continue to be in there 60% of the time. Now there are some limitations, but we can probably get into it, that later. Um, but yeah, that's the basic. It's the most basic one. A lot of fans still love batting average. And this is a really quotable mm -hmm. leader average is a really consistent. It speaks to the consistency of the athlete. So when you're coming up with these numbers, is this just based on their performance from the past year? So that that's, and, and that's the thing, like I wanted to create something we could go forward and talk about and quote um, Chad Schroeder and I have been going back and forth about getting historical data and that just takes a lot of time and so what i wanted to pull was for this season and so this includes all the off-season events and the open and the quarterfinals and so after semifinals i will update them and we'll have a new season so then you know year to year you could compare what are this year's statistics versus historically how are they performing you could see dips and like oh they're not they're not hitting on all cylinders we could see that the other thing that's you know kind of neat about it is it's, uh, you know, they're not all doing the same events, but in this met, in this right. system, we can, you know, but that's how CrossFit is. It's, it's, it's random. The events you'll do or the number of the events or time domains or whatever. Um, but this can show over time, um, you know, therefore say, well, whatever, it doesn't matter what events pop up 50% of the time, Romans finishing in the top five of whatever the events happen to be. And that's kind of a cool right. thing to be able to say at least as a starting point when trying to have a conversation about how good this guy is for that girl. Is. When looking at the longevity of the sport and creating this data and getting the stats on uh, athletes or players rather, um, how many consecutive years of them being part of the sport do you need to really see a good picture? Brian, you want to go first? Let me go first. <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, that's a, that's a tough, uh, that's a tough question. Um, and I, I really, the person that comes to mind is Justin Medeiros. And, you know, everyone's kind of wondering, like, how good is this guy? And we obviously have seen him in the last two competitions he's done, live competitions he's done, being Rogue and, and the games, look very, very impressive. Um, but you go even one competition further back from that to the MAC where he only placed third. And it's like, well, if you're dominating and winning the games and dominating and winning Rogue, what happened there? So that's not even 12 months period of time. And then you have to go back and you see that he's, the last time, the only other time he was at the games, he also got third. So he's stringing together some consistent performances. But are they dominating performances that suggest of a dynasty? And really the answer is he's only two years in. And when I do my um, like like all-time power rankings, I don't, I don't even consider you an option for that list if you haven't at least been to three CrossFit games. Mm. So he's not even in contention to be on my list until one more time at the game. So I would say that three, three years is probably like a good – number of years where you can start to really paint a picture of what an athlete's consistency or expected results would be over time. What about for you, Tyler? So would that was agree something with that? that I thought was interesting. Um, I thought it was interesting when I looked at Tia, uh, I pulled a rich Matt and Tia just to get a, an idea of like who our Babe Ruths are. And so I wanted to compare them and, and think about like what data was useful for them. Well, Tia sort of started off slow. Um, whereas Justin basically overnight was a great, and it, it hurts her statistics almost started off that slowly. Right. So, well, arguably if, she yeah, should, go ahead. If we'd had these statistics when she first came up though, what it would have allowed us to see is, oh, she's doing pretty well. And then all of a sudden we could say, okay, but look at these first three years compared to these last three years. And, and that was like very obvious that the jump was made from this year to that year. 
Right. So what are these numbers over on uh, the sides here? Maybe I need to make this smaller. <laughs> Those are the... Yeah, what, um, so what are all in, these? <laughs> in, in the column with one, in the column with one, that's the number of times um, the athlete got first place, the number of times they got second place, mm -hmm. third, um, throughout their CrossFit official events only. So open, regionals, sanctionals, sectionals semifinals and the games okay so and it's Brian, actually and actually and actually that's a good it's a good thing that he, that we have this up here because you can kind of see especially we can just look at rich versus matt there at the top so rich has only had 36 first place finishes to matt's 62 and it's like holy cow man. matt's like almost doubling him in this statistic yeah. but if you slide back right. over to the averages and you see riches are on top and basically wow. what this is telling me is Rich competed for a shorter period of time that probably aligned with the prime of his career, or he was just that much ahead of the field during those years so that his stats are inflated by the, sh the short duration of his individual career relative to Matt's. It was almost half the events that he competed in compared to Matt. So when you guys, uh, well, let, let's start with Brian. Brian, when you give your power rankings or your predictions on who's going to do well for a year, are these the components that you use on um, the leader average performance rate or, and podium rate, or, there, or are there other metrics that you've been using thus far? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I, don't, I don't have a specific place that has these metrics laid out in such a clean and organized fashion as Tyler does. However, these are the things that I'm thinking about when I look at the events or the, you know, the competition that's coming up and I can see, okay, there's probably going to be this number of events and they're probably going to be of this general feel because we kind of, we have a pretty good idea from history of, you know, the short history of the sport already, what a semifinal or regional weekend's going to encompass, what a games competition is going to encompass, what Rogue looks like, what Dubai looks like, what Wada Plus looks like. So I draw, draw off past information, project what the weekend could potentially look like, look at the athlete field that's competing there, and then I'm basically asking myself these questions just without previously um, not having them labeled in this way. The one other thing that I look at that I'm not sure is accounted for in either of these is the you know, the potential for really bad performances, you know, if, and so there are some obvious examples that come to mind where you think this person's really, really good at just about everything. But if this thing pops up or if a test like this pops up, then that's going to be a hit. And, and when that is really relevant is when you see what we were looking at on the men's side, where it's like really tight on the leader average, everyone's between 35 and 40%. Then if you just see one of those guys that's like, yeah, but there's a heavy barbell, you know, workout that's come out that's probably going to be a hit relative to the other people that have a similar leader average. So I would move that person down compared to those others. That's the one thing that I'm not sure is included in these initial three statistics. Yeah. And that's because I had to, the, we never know what the bottom position is. You know, in the games, it's 40, but, you know, in the open, it could be, you know, <laughs> a ridiculous <laughs> number. And it's like, I can never control that. So you have to measure it from the top. Um, that's it, you know. That was, a, but I did think about that last night. I was like, well, this, you know, the confounds within that. Another one is also quality of competition. So this one is in particular interesting with Roman. Roman has only competed in Dubai, the Open, and the quarterfinals. Well, the the athlete pool there was good, but only really the top five guys. After that, it falls off pretty dramatically, and it's like, okay, the density of the competition affects the statistics. He got so many first, second place, you know, top five, because after, you know, Ricky and a couple of other guys, there wasn't really anybody to battle through. When looking at CrossFit on a bigger spectrum, how early are we into developing stats for athletes at this point? I mean, I think infancy, really, you know, there's, there's, um, there are a couple people out there that have gathered and started putting together things that you you know are very valuable resources for sure but there's nothing like this yet like this is the first thing that i've seen that is a um a coherent and simple way that someone can look at it understand it relative to another sport that most people are familiar with and 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 see how athletes performances you know, like translate to a spreadsheet that's identifying you know specific and consistent statistics over time so i think this is like Ground zero almost. Tyler, uh, 
Have you ever thought about working for CrossFit? <laughs> yeah. A couple times. I feel like CrossFit, well, they, they need people like both of you who care about it and are putting the time and energy to make documents like this just for the longevity and professionalism of the sports. I, I, I guess I just wonder why CrossFit hasn't seeked you guys out or maybe they have or why they, they haven't done this themselves. I think about this from time to time. So I'm an accountant, my regular day job and I'm an accountant. And, and you still have time to make spreadsheets like that? <laughs> No, uh, <laughs> generally people, people put off hiring accountants, even though it's a very important job and, and you're really suffering by not hiring an accountant, they will put them off because you don't produce anything that actually makes money. And this is something that I think we, we are an extra cost that, yeah, we will produce on the content side, but we don't produce as far as things that actually make dollars. And, and that's how I can, you know, conceive it. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, even in the work that I've done with various competitions over the last couple of years, you know, uh, especially early on, people are like, oh, my God, we want to have you here. We want you to contribute. You know, you're adding value. But it was there wasn't like a defined role or position that they're like they can that they could go to their whoever's managing their budget and say, yeah, we want to hire this guy for this position. Like that position didn't really exist. Um, a little bit with the broadcast because they want to, you know, prepare stats on the on the screen that accompanying whatever is being talked about, and that's what Trad Schrader has been a big mm -hmm. part of for the last ten years or so um, with the games team and the and that crew. But uh, you know, not a, not every competition um, has the same you know ability in the sport right now to have a professional broadcast of that level or a budget to support it. And so you know, sometimes then. You know, I think about, I always think about it like the NFL, you know, the, the commentators are there on the, and, and you know that there's some guy that's back in the truck that's, that's feeding them information at, like in real time as things are happening or records are being yeah. broken or whatever else. But my guess is that that, you know, that in the early days of the NFL, that that wasn't existing and there were just like people with paper that were figuring it out. And that's what I've seen, you know, I've seen in the CrossFit Games and actually I've seen an evolution of it over the last couple of years, even where it's becoming more and more understandable how valuable having people who understand that information and can deliver it quickly is but like i said this is still just really early years and you know work like tyler's doing here i think is really important for laying a, a, a groundwork a foundation that people can then build off of going forward and start to figure out how we can incorporate people like him and, and me maybe into some of those roles more consistently going forward tyler what is the bottom line to having data like this to predict athlete performance? It's going to make the sport more exciting. It's going to give you quick picture, uh, you know, quick numbers to talk about, easy way to compare athletes. It's going to make it more accessible to everyone. I think it's a big thing that, that the community is missing out on at this point. Yeah. Brian, what's your bottom line? I would say that in addition to that, it also allows for more uh, ease to tell the history of the sport. You know, obviously that work that he referenced that he wants to do with Chad, we, we need to go back and, and, and enter that into this kind of, you know, formulas or situations or percentages that we want to represent. But having once we once you do that work, then you can say, like, you know, this is what it looked like in the in the first five years, the first 10 years. And then we can build on that going forward and start to tell patterns and stories over time. Brian Friend, Tyler Watkins, thank you guys so much for joining us. This is incredible information. We are also going to link your story, Tyler, uh, to the description on our YouTube channel so you guys can go catch it out. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks, Lauren.